Hello, my name is Shirley Geiger, and I am talking to you today in my capacity as chair of the Faculty Learning Assessment Council. This is a council that was set up in 2008 by Sylvia Gray. Uh, the leadership of the council rotates through faculty members here at PCC, so I have been the chair uh, 2010 and 2011. I'm here to tell you my story, the story of how I came to be very excited about assessment and a uh, part of setting up this class, this hybrid class on program or discipline assessment at PCC. My story starts in the fall of 2008. There I was happily an adjunct faculty member teaching philosophy. Sylvia Gray had agreed to head up the, new, the newly organized Learning Assessment Council, and she asked me to participate to give adjunct faculty input. I had been very happy to never join any committees at PCC. I thought that was part of the joy of being adjunct. But I liked Sylvia a lot, and I had a friend, a very good friend, who was a third grade teacher in the Portland Public School System. And I had been hearing from her for several years now about how the No Child Left Behind Act had ruined her fun. Indeed, she took early retirement because she was so disgusted with how she believed the No Child Left Behind uh, Act had ruined education in America today. So the accountability movement, uh, that's what the Learning Assessment Council was formed to respond to. Uh, the accountability movement I translated into No Child Left Behind comes to a college or university near you. Indeed, in the late 90s, there was a report from a commission, it's called the Spellings Commission Report, that was extending the uh, requirements for accountability to higher education. The commission suggested uh, strongly that colleges and universities in the United States needed to measure outcomes to compare the value they were adding to students' lives. And uh, I was thinking that that was going to ruin my fun as a teacher at PCC the way it had ruined my friend's fun as a third grade teacher. So I just wanted to be prepared for what was coming down the turnpike. Now that first year on the Assessment Council, we were charged with a year of inquiry, a year of study, and I must say that much of the first part of that year, I was sullen, cynical, bitter, and defended. But a few things happened to shift my thinking, and I wanna share them with you today. The first shift in my thinking came from reading a short piece called The Assessment Manifesto by Rick Stiggins. You will have a link to this in the hybrid class. Now, I'm a person who came of age in the 1970s, and an assessment manifesto, well, manifesto is sort of my genre. So uh, this short, energetic piece was the first thing I read in a pile of reading about assessment that really spun me around. One of the things Rick Stiggin said in the Assessment Manifesto is every teacher has a kind of picture or theory of grading. They have a picture of assessment and it's oftentimes not articulated. Well, of course, as soon as he said that, I had to articulate my theory of assessment, my theory of grading, and here it is in a nutshell. I viewed grading as the least fun part of teaching philosophy, and I wanted to do my very best to make sure the requirement that I turn in grades at the end of a quarter not mess up my fun or the students' learning. But on the other hand, I had an audience in mind when I was grading, when I was recording those A's and B's and C's and occasional D's. Over my shoulder, I had an imaginary colleague, a member of my SAC, and I kept in mind that at some shadowy point in the future, someone, some colleague, might ask me to justify my grades. So my audience was that potential colleague who was questioning my professional judgment. So that is how I approached grading. Now Rick Stiggins had a different theory of grading, a different model of grading, and his first big distinction had to do with the audience. Who is the assessing for? Stiggins says the first and indeed most important audience of assessment information has to be the student. 
That is, the student needs to be able to allocate him or herself as an educational resource. They need to know what to spend more time on, be freed up, you got that down, go over here. So he said that faculty members, instructors, teachers, we owe our students, this is like an, an obligation, a serious moral obligation to have fast, accurate, frequent feedback so they know how they're doing. The other thing he said, which really resonated with me, is when we tell someone that they have not learned what we had hoped they had learned, we need to make sure we deliver that information in a way that is not shaming. So the fast, accurate, frequent feedback to the student says, this is what I think you've got, this is what I think you have not yet understood, and if you want to understand it, it is my professional judgment that this would be a good route for you to take. Students need to know how they're doing so they can make informed decisions about what to do next, and the accuracy of that feedback becomes really important. The, the formative assessment is assessment that is done in the middle of an educational process. It is done to let somebody know what they should do next. And the idea of formative assessment and the priority of formative assessment uh, distinguishes it from grading, which in the assessment world is known as summative assessment. Summative assessment is done at the end of a an education process to report out the results, usually to an external audience. So the distinction between formative and summative assessment processes started sinking into my brain and really changed what I thought I should be doing as a teacher. Uh, the notion that the student is the primary and most important audience of all assessment activities and that the most uh, energy I should be put into assessing is formative has completely changed my educational practices. So that first year of the existence of the Learning Assessment Council, 2008-2009, we were charged with recommending to the college at the end of that year how Portland Community College should respond to this new demand for accountability. Uh, one of the things that we did during that year, which which produced the second big change in my thinking, was we decided to do a little survey of PCC faculty and ask them some questions, just see where they were in terms of understanding the change in the expectation of higher ed. We asked faculty if they were familiar with the notion of an outcome, a learning outcome that should be assessed, and specifically we asked them if they were familiar with PCC's core outcomes. We discovered that a lot of faculty were, well, like me, busy working in their classrooms trying to be the best teacher they could be, but not paying attention to the broader context in which they were doing the work. We threw in a question in that survey uh, that had to do with what PCC could provide faculty at uh, this college that would make their job easier or more effective. What did they wish they had that they didn't have that would make a difference in their ability to um, work as educators? And over and over, in rather poignant and touching ways, Instructors said what they wish they had was connection. That this was a college, but what they missed was collegiality. Over and over, we heard faculty members say they felt isolated. They were working as hard as they could, but they were working in a, a, an isolated situation. They were hungry for feedback and connection. Well, as we were thinking about this in the Learning Assessment Council, we thought that perhaps there was a beneficial overlap because assessment of the sort we were being charged to do was quite different from the kind of evaluations that had been done previously. Quite often, faculty members had evaluations of their work done as part of uh, hiring or promoting or uh, some sort of uh, granting of uh, tenure. 
That is, faculty were used to being assessed as individual faculty members. Likewise, as teachers, we were used to assessing, that is, grading the performance of individual students. But the change at PCC was from an I, how am I doing, to a we, how are we doing? That is, we, were being, we are being held accountable for our collective learning outcomes. The PCC core outcomes are a particular kind of promise that if a student leaves PCC with a degree or a certificate completely regardless of how they found their way to meeting the degree requirements, which classes they took, and from which instructor, nonetheless, we were promising that they would be meeting these college outcomes. If we were going to assess whether our students were meeting our outcomes, we needed to collaborate, we need to create a new sense of we. How are we doing? So the Learning Assessment Council asked that faculty through their subject area committees, through their SACs, work together at assessments to discover how their programs were doing for their students. I am self-motivated. I work well independently. I do not need a lot of supervision and I actually don't want a lot of supervision. Many teachers, I think, are highly skilled at that kind of self-directed, self-motivated, responsible and independent work. But if we are going to be able to meet the change demands of program, discipline, and institutional assessment, we have got to learn how to collaborate. We have got to break out of the isolation imposed on us by our individual classroom walls and, and turn toward one another, learning how to construct a we, and ask the question, how are we doing? We so far have not had as much practice working in teams, and so the Learning Assessment Council came to believe that we had to set up some vehicles, some routes for people to brush up on their collaboration skills. So the next big shift in my thinking in that year of inquiry on the Learning Assessment Council, I went from thinking that collaboration was going to be a nice sort of bonus or side benefit of the accountability movement, the demand for assessment. I went from thinking that it was you know, a nice extra to thinking that it was incredibly necessary that it was something that we were going to have to do if we were going to be able to succeed. Well, that whole notion of success in higher education brings up uh, the context in which many of us are laboring, and that is this conversation about whether higher education needs reform, whether it is failing, whether it is doing such a bad job that it needs to be totally changed. And the question of whether people in higher education are failing their students and the taxpayers, well, it makes it a bit hard to go to work every day with a smile on your face. But after a bit, I began to think it made sense to worry about whether higher education was up for the job because one of the things that has happened in the last decade, maybe two decades, is that the job higher education is being asked to do has changed in very fundamental ways. And I heard a person speak about this change in the job requirements, change in the job demands, uh, in terms of what he called the pyramid of the impossible. So the pyramid of the impossible comes from three requirements for higher education now, the three new pieces of our, our, our job demand. And the first one is that higher education is being asked to open its doors ever wider. That is, to increase our access to ever more students. Uh, and these are students from classes, from categories, from groups that were previously excluded. It's hard to gear up for this many new students and to make sure that we have enough sections for them and people to process their registration, advisors and counselors to help them figure out what to take. But this is only one side of the pyramid. We are asked to increase our access 
and simultaneously increase the rate of students who leave our colleges and universities with degrees and certificates. Now one easy way to open our doors wider and make sure a higher percentage of students leave with degrees and certificates is if we would make the degrees and certificates easier to get, if we would water down our standard. But if the degrees are watered down, they will lose their legitimacy out there in the world. So more students in, some of those requiring additional resources that were not needed before remedial work, counseling, extra language work for people uh, entering with uh, English, not their native language. So ever greater access and a higher rate of completion with a meaningful degree. Oh, but here's the third part of this pyramid. We are going to have fewer resources per student. We are supposed to do this work with less money instead of more. The idea that we grant greater access, provide a higher rate of completion, and we do this with less money, well, if you stand back and think about those three together, it's not surprising that there are questions about how effective higher education is being. I think it is a good thing to keep in mind when people are talking about how education is failing our population, it's not clear that this job can be done. But if it's doable, it is because we are going to enter an era of unprecedented collaboration among educators. No longer can we afford to be isolated in our classrooms, each of us innovating to do the best job that we can. We need to start sharing amongst ourselves what we have discovered, what works if we have any chance whatsoever of meeting this new, this new request to be effective. But as faculty members have talked to each other, I have noticed a piece of the conversation that bothered me a lot. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that it was one of those cases of people using the same language, but with different definitions. So with respect to this idea that we are going to be graduating higher rates of our students, I had many instructors talk to me uh, over the course of uh, rotating around uh, with the Learning Assessment Council, and they said something to me like this. You know, when I was in college, either in my graduate experience or undergraduate experience with the senior level classes, I had teachers say something like this. They said, hey, students, look to the right and look to the left. At the end of this year, only one of those three people will still be here. That is, a major function of higher education was to serve as a gatekeeper. As some people would pass through, and in the ideal of a meritocracy, those would be the ones who had earned it. But other people would wash out. And grading, especially grading on a curve, serves the function of figuring out who to let go forward and who to wash out. This kind of grading or summative assessment is called norm referenced. Ideally, we have assessment instruments that produce that bell-shaped curve. That is, we figure out who are the exceptionally wonderful, who are the exceptionally horrible, and who is average. And depending on how few positions there are, we only dip into the exceptionally wonderful and exceptionally, exceptionally wonderful to let them go through. But I remind you, with the pyramid of the impossible, we are not allowed to wash people out. We are being asked to, to get everybody through as close to 100% as possible. And in order to do that, we need to change our thinking from assessment instruments that are norm referenced to assessment in, in, instruments that are criterion referenced. In criterion-based assessments, each student or each student performance is compared to a standard, a standard that doesn't change. And the assessment gives a yes or a no answer. Either this student met that standard or they didn't. You can have a good assessment if it's criterion referenced and have everybody fail. 
But it's also possible to have a good assessment if it's criterion based and have everybody succeed. Indeed, if we have criterion based assessments and we are effective at education, we want as close to 100% of our students to succeed as possible. This is not because we have taken the average and made it A, watering down our standards. Rather, it's a different kind of standard. The people are not being compared to each other. It's only if we have criterion-based assessments that we will be able to meet this new demand of higher rates of our students meeting the standard. This is a really big change between norm-referenced and criterion-referenced. And as faculty come to understand it, there will be less um, confusion about what it is we are doing and less consternation over the idea that we are watering down our standards. So by the end of that year of inquiry on the Learning Assessment Council, 2008-2009, my head was seriously spinning. I had thought I had been a good teacher, I had longed to be a good teacher, but many, many, many ways of thinking that I had had for my teaching career, they were spun around, they were changed. It was a particular kind of vertigo. And after a while I remembered I had like a class in graduate school where they talked about this. And it was the class in paradigm shifts. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm experiencing a paradigm shift. Now, paradigm shift is by definition disconcerting and disorienting, but I wanted to try to get a little bit firmer sense of what we were doing. And so I analyzed the change in the paradigm and I decided it's really a three-stepper. There are three steps involved in going from the old way to think about teaching to the new way of thinking about teaching. If we are going to be uh, effective, I think it would be helpful for all of us to understand these three steps. Now the first step may be the hardest, at least for me, I discover over and over that as much as I aspire to it, I don't really have it down. That's because I think of myself as a teacher. And as a teacher, my question has been, what shall I teach today? I create an outline of ideas that I want to convey, the things I want to say. Indeed, I remember when I was a new teacher of philosophy, I had this idea that my job as a teacher was to say everything on my list one time right. <laughs> I just had to say it right one time and my job would be done. Slowly, I realized that me saying it one time right did not mean a student heard it and understood it that one time. So I got the notion that I was supposed to repeat myself, maybe in multiple ways. But all of this is still a paradigm that people now call covering the material. This is a covering the material paradigm and it's teacher centric. It's from my point of view, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, my order. The first big step in this new paradigm is to move from teacher-centric thinking to student-centered thinking. Instead of what shall I teach today, the question is, what do I want my students to learn today? This is the movement from teaching goals to learning outcomes. I remember at PCC going to a SAC meeting, a subject area committee meeting, where we were busy changing all of our language from course goals to course outcomes. And I don't think we understood what we were doing. That is, we were complying with an administrative request that felt to us kind of silly, just like a hoop to be jumping through. And maybe it's good that we didn't know what we were doing because this is a huge shift in higher education, from teacher-centric to student-centered. What do I want my students to learn, the movement to student, student learning outcomes? One thing I would like to say as I started to understand that difference is that thinking about the process in terms of student learning outcomes is really somewhat liberating. 
That is, different teachers can arrange really different sets of experiences. You don't have to teach alike. The question is whether those two different ways of approaching or setting up a classroom are equally effective at the learning outcomes. If what we're asking is what did the student learn, not what did the teacher teach, it leaves open a possibility for incredible innovation and diversity in terms of how those outcomes are met. So the first step in the paradigm shift, the first part of my vertigo, was going from teacher-centered to student-centered activities, teacher-centric to learner-centric thinking on my part. But now the second step here, the second step in this paradigm shift, is once you're thinking about outcomes, the student, what the student is achieving, the, the challenge is to think of outcomes not just in your classroom. I'm a philosophy teacher and have been for a really long time, and part of that is because I'm a deep believer in the value of critical thinking. But the accountability movement asks me to think about what difference I think I am making in people's lives, not just in my classroom, but in the rest of their lives. And I guess always I had the idea that from taking a critical thinking class, a student would become better at thinking critically. Not just in my classroom, not just when they aced the final exam, but in their life as a citizen, in their communities, perhaps in their neighborhood association, in their families, in their work life. If the difference I'm trying to make in somebody's life is not just in my classroom, but outside the classroom, in their life out there, the question becomes, how can I tell if I'm making that difference? Now, summative assessments are in the classroom, but if we at PCC are saying people leaving with degrees or certificates have increased their critical thinking, well, I'd like to know, for example, if there's higher voting rates among graduates than those who don't go to school. I would like to know if there's more civic engagement or participation. I would like to know if in their workplaces they are more likely to challenge the status quo, innovate, come up with new ideas. That's what it means to think about the outcomes out there. We are not going to be able to directly assess those as instructors, but we can allocate resources institutional resources to follow our students into their lives and see if we are really making the difference we say that we are making. Well, the third step in the accountability movement, the third step in changing the education of higher, the paradigm of higher education is once you have articulated the outcomes out there, ask yourself, how could you tell? Ask for a metric. Ask how we could find out if the difference in people's lives we want to be making, well, if we're actually making that. We need to know if we are succeeding. Now, some of the pressure on higher education I have come to think is, a, is appropriate. It's because what we are doing is really important. I believe that all of us are living in precarious times. The problems that are facing humanity, collective problems, are really, really big. Uh, I have been told sometimes that I'm a bit dramatic, some people say even melodramatic, but in a melodramatic sort of way, I think the desire of educators to make a difference in the world is coupled at this point in the history of the earth with incredible need for that difference. But I want you to think for a moment about the promise we're making to our students about what our core outcomes say is the difference we are making in people's lives. We have six core outcomes and I'm just gonna jumble them all together. We at Portland Community College are promising that students who graduate from PCC with a degree or certificate will be able to collaborate to together across the traditional divides of culture, ethnicity, 
religion, identity, and come together around our communal issues. We say they will have acquired a willingness to walk toward our collective social and environmental problems instead of running away. We say they will have a sense of themselves within the larger universe from the practice of self-reflection, self-awareness. They will be aware of their own talents. They will have had a chance to artic articulate their own values and ideals, their aspirations. And with this base, they will be able to work with others, exercising creative problem solving, thinking critically, using those communication collaboration skills to work together to solve the huge collective problems my generation has left them. Oh, and we say they will have all that and be able to earn a living consistent with their own values and sense of self. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe humankind is facing some enormous problems right now. I believe these are incredibly precarious times. And the reason there's additional pressure on higher education and higher educators is because our ability to keep our promise to our students could be the difference between the possibility of a future for humans on this earth and that possibility being closed. We must be adequate to our promises.